This might hurt a little bit, boys and girls. But this is such a good word. We're going back to my original series, How God Sees Life. It's being life through God's eyes. We did the first part where life is a test. And we spent several weeks on that, breaking it down. And now we're on this one. And I want to finish this up because I want to get to the third part of this series is that life is a temporary assignment. And these are just profound words where you understand what your job is, what, what life is all about, and what the expectation that God has for you on this earth. It doesn't matter if you're a little kid or a grown person. God still has a responsibility that he's given you. Amen? But anyway, I want to do a quick recap. Can, and then the title of the sermon was, Can God Trust You With a Few Things? It wasn't about us trusting God. <laughs> we didn't create heaven and earth. It was about God trusting you. And so before you start to think and wonder off, pay attention to what the <coughs> recap is. I, I started this out saying that, uh, can God trust you with a few things? And it was talked about our time on earth, uh, our opportunities in life, our strength, our health, our relationships, our resources, which is our money, our material assets, our collective wealth, are all gifts from God. Can God trust you with this gift? I'm looking at the athletic role. Sidarius, so Justin, and Sam. And I want to ask the athletic people, can God trust you with your athleticism? That is a gift. Yeah, even though your mom and dad spurned you, it doesn't mean that that was what was in their genetic makeup. It was always God's genetic makeup that put it in your mom and dad's makeup. So everything that you've got, all your athleticism, all your talents, all your skills, all your smart, these are all gifts. And we have to come to the understanding that everything in life, from bread on our table to, to gas in our car to, to, to having a roof over our head to the shoes on our feet to the clothes on our back to our job, whether it pays you $60,000, $100,000, or $40,000, it is a gift. And when we change the way we see these things, that it's not you, it's not your intellect, it's not your talent, it's not your skill, it is all a gift that God has given, and he wants to know, can he trust you with his gift? And that's why I came up with the title, Can God Trust You With a Few Things? We realize in breaking down this series that uh, we were all stewards of whatever God gives us, and a steward is uh, we supervise and take care and oversee and protect what is God's. That's what a steward does. And then we, we understand the concept of stewardship, which is this, the first rule that we recognize that God is the owner of everything on and in earth. That's the concept, the first rule of stewardship. And then we went on that in Psalms 24 and 1, it says that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, and the world and all its people belongs to him. And we established that. And then we went on to, to say that he appoints us as trustees. For those who don't know what a trustee is, let me just read it, what it, what it is real quick. It, it is legally and morally bound to manage the trust property in a responsible and productive manner. God has made you trustees. And once you become a trustee, you realize this. And here's the first duty of a trustee is to become fully acquainted with the terms of the trust. And I broke down that Adam and Eve did not come fully acquainted with the terms that they did not come fully uh, acquainted with the terms. And what was the terms? Out of all the trees in the garden, you can eat up, but do not eat of that one. They should have read the fine print, huh? And so when God made us trust, this is what we have, we came up with that everything in life is a trust. And that we have to look at it as a trust. And I just want to give you the, the legal definition of when I say this catchphrase, you have to treat things as a trust. This is what I'm talking about. As a trust, it means this, that God has given place confidence in you by making you a nominal owner. Now what the word nominal means, and pay attention to this word, a nominal owner is this, a role or a status title in name only. And you have no rights of ownership. So when you become a trustee of God, you don't own nothing. But I own my house. You don't own that. I own my car. Can you? If you own it, you can take it to eternity. If you own it, it's going to go in your coffin with you, and it's going to be resurrected with you. You don't even own the body you walk. 
walking in. Amen. I just thought this was so mind blowing. I never even heard of the word nominal. I had to Google it and look it up. And it says that it's a role. <coughs> We're playing our role on earth. It's a status. God gives status to different people. Some are kings and some are servants, right? Some are presidents, some are governors, some are housewife, some are husbands, some are caretakers, some are workers. And he says that uh, we're, we, we're playing a role of status in title and name only. That means when you get to heaven, that name don't mean nothing. But God, I, I was a president <coughs> of Zimbabwe. Good, go over there, president of Zimbabwe, because you ain't did nothing for me. And, and so you you it's a name and a title and you have no rights to ownership. The worst thing I hate about humans is that we think that they own something. What did the white men do to the Indians? They said, we own this land, kill them all. They don't own nothing. We could have shared, right? What did Texas do to Mexico? Say, this is ours. We own it. Man has been claiming, man has been bad trustees all their life. From the first man all the way down. Because we talked about that Adam and Eve didn't read the contract. And so the first thing as a trustee, I said, is to become acquainted with the terms of the trust. Did God not give Adam and Eve a bunch of terms of what they should do and what they should not do? Did God not give the children of Israel a bunch of terms of what they should do and what they shouldn't do? Did God bring salvation and Jesus gave us a bunch of terms of what we should do and what we shouldn't do? Yes. Are you a good trustee? I don't know. We're going to get to the end of that. And listen to this. A nominal owner of the property to be held and used. What is we supposed to do with the property God gave? To benefit of one or more or others. That means what God has given us and trusted us, it's not for us. We went on to 1 Corinthians 4 and 7 where it says, oh, this is for the prideful folks. Pay attention. What do you have that God hasn't given you? And if all you have is from God, why do you boast as though you have accomplished something on your own? And so when we got done with 1 Corinthians 4 and 7, that was the last thing we did. So now I'd like to start my sermon. Can God trust you with this property? And can you be a good trustee for the Lord? Can you manage it without thinking <coughs> only? You see, what I'm trying to do today is to teach you one thing. One thing that I don't know if you've ever been mindful of, but that nothing belongs to you. That Psalms 24 says that all of earth and everything in it belongs to the Lord. And you know, once we have that concept, then we become more grateful. Then we become better stewards of what God has asked us to do. And God has never asked you to do but one thing. Manage what he has given you. That's from your kids, to your finances, to your job, to your health, to everything. You have to manage what God has given to you. <laughs> and in our culture, our culture, which is our attitudes, our customs, and beliefs, our human intellect, show achievements, in our society, our culture says this, if you don't own it, you won't take care of it. But go to First Peter's and I'm going to tell you why you should take care of it. Because this is why. Our culture tells us that we don't have to take care of what God has given us. We don't have to take care of the earth. We don't have to take care of our family. We don't have to take care of anything. You know why? Because we are employed to be in charge. We own it. It's ours. So if you own it, you can do what you want to do with it. But I'm here to tell you as a Christian, as a man and woman of God, we have to have a different philosophy about life. We have to see things through God's eyes, not through the world's eyes. We can't be caught up in how our, our culture dictates the world to us. We got to be caught up in how the word of God dictates the world to us. Amen? And so in combating this belief that they say if you don't own it, you won't take care of it, First Peter's and tells us why we're going to take care of it. And if you go to First Peter's chapter 2, verse 9, it says, but you are not like that. First Peter's. Chapter 2, verse 9 starts out, but you are not like that, for you are chosen. You are a, a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. And you are a peculiar 
people. And I, I just wanted to, to look up the definition of peculiar because I got excited about it. I'm glad that I'm peculiar. I'm glad that I'm not the same creature of habit that goes and do the same thing that everybody else. I'm glad I'm different. I'm glad that God has made me different because when I'm peculiar, it means that I'm strange. It means that I'm odd. It means that I'm unusual. It means that I'm funny. Yeah, I'm funny. It means that I'm curious. Oh, yes, but not so curious when it killed the cat. It means that I'm bizarre and weird and abnormal, but it also means that I'm exceptional. God only made one of me. It means that I'm extraordinary. Yes, I can, because I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. It means that I, I'm remarkable. You ain't never seen nothing like that. It means that I belong exclusively to God. And this is why I don't follow the culture. This is why I know that I will be a good steward, because it's not mine and I don't own it. So because of that, I'm going to take care of it. I'm going to be a good trustee, oh God. I'm going to be a good steward, oh God. And it says here, as a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for he called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. But as Christians, Christians, I'm talking to the Christians now, pay attention, saints. Christians are servants of Christ. Christians aren't servants of themselves, but we've been doing a lot of selfish serving in the church these days, haven't we? It's all about my mansion. Christians are those who minister the gospel of Christ. We live by a higher standard, which is everything is a gift from God, and God owns it first and foremost. Listen, even our lives, even our lives, man, it's nothing but a mess in the bank. Here today, we just heard a song. Going tomorrow, a flower quickly fading. Hmm. And when we have that philosophy that God owns it first and foremost, we come up with this thinking that I must take care of it the best way that I can. Doesn't mean I'm not going to make mistakes. But I gotta always remember, I gotta put God first in everything I do. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 4, and I love reading this in the Amplified Version, just let me read this to you. It says this in 1 Corinthians 4, uh, verse 1 and 2 in the Amplified, it says, So then let us be regarded as servants of Christ and stewards, meaning trustees and administrators of the mysteries of God. What are the mysteries of God? Right now, this philosophy that we're learning, it's a mystery of God, that God owns everything, and that nothing belongs to us. Imagine if the world caught that concept of that mystery of God, of understanding we wouldn't have no starvation in the world today. We wouldn't have the have and the have-nots. We wouldn't have those that have medical and those that don't. There wouldn't be such a great disparity of the rich and the poor. Because everything that the rich have, they think that it's their accumulative wealth and that they own it all because they mama's mama's daddy daddy had it and they passed it down. But then verse 2 it says, in this case, moreover, it is required as essential and demanded of stewards that one be found faithful and trustworthy. Are you faithful? Are you trustworthy? Can God trust you with a few things? Do you realize that everything you have is a gift from God? Even when you cursed him, that you was driving a jalopy, and you wanted a Cadillac, even when you cursed him that you had a job, a minimum wage job, and you wanted a career, even when you cursed him that you didn't have this, and you didn't have that, and you didn't have this, come on now, I know I've done the same thing. To be found faithful and trustworthy is what God requires from us. The 
because God has entrusted us with something very valuable. He's entrusted us with the world and all that is in it. You may not be able to change the big part of the world, but you can change the part of your world. You can affect those that are around you. You can affect those in your immediate core, in your immediate circle. You can affect those in your family because the ministry and everything about God begins there with your own children and your own life. Jesus often referred to life as a trust. And when I say as a trust, I just read that to you. It's what God sees. He's saying that I can, can I depend on you. He's saying, will you be a nominal owner and not think that you own some? Sometimes us people, we think we own our wives. Sometimes us wives think we own our husband. Sometimes we think we own our kids. Well, you came out of me and I made you, so I own you. You don't own that kid. You know how many women have laid hands on to open their wounds and God has blessed them with a baby? Well, can I tell you how many that hasn't? So you'll never look at kids that it's just part of being a woman. It is a blessing. It is a gift. It is a trust. Amen. And one of the things that God gives us as parents is to teach the ways of God in our coming, in our goings, in our rising, in our settings, on the road. We're to teach them the ways of God. Now you wonder why you ain't got them because you haven't fulfilled your first gift that God gave you. Yeah, I was a dope head. I was a hustler. I was a meth head. I was a thug. But I taught my kids all about God. Even if I didn't want them. Because I knew that that was my first priority. Matthew 25. Get there, get there. Let's go. We're going to read what Jesus is saying. This is red letter for those that don't have the red letter Bible. This is all red letter from here on out. Okay? Jesus referred to life as a trust and told many stories to illustrate this responsibility. Last Sunday I said there's over 50, 60 parables in the Bible where Jesus is speaking. Jesus, God in heaven, the second of the Trinity. Not baby Jesus, he only did Gaga Google. I'm talking about big Jesus. Before he came down, it was little Jesus. He was a God in heaven first. I'm talking about that guy. Okay? And so um, he gave us all kinds of illustrations, and this one in particular is one of my favorites. It's in Matthew 25 and verse 14. And it says this. This is Jesus speaking. He says, again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. Stop. This is how wise God is. He's telling you, pay attention. I'm about to tell you a story that will illustrate, give you a snapshot, give you a view of what the kingdom of heaven is all about. How many know that the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of earth is totally two different kingdoms? They're governed by two different things. All is governed by God, but one is governed by the spirit and one is governed by the flesh. So what we're talking about when Jesus gives you an illustration, when Jesus speaks a parable, you need to take off your carnal ears and put on your spiritual ears. He that have an ear, let him hear what Jesus is saying in a parable. Oh, now you get that. That's why his disciples are like, God, are you, are you talking to us? Or is it for somebody else? And he goes, fool, I'm talking to you because it's not time for them to know what I'm talking about. <clears throat> so pay attention. So this is Jesus. He's saying again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by a story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted this, his money to them while he was gone. He entrusted just like God has entrusted you with everything that you have in this world. He entrusted you with it. The kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by a story. And he says this, he said, he gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another. 
and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it in proportion, listen to this, to their abilities. Oh, God won't give you more than you can handle. He knows that if he gave the guy with one bag, five bags, he would misuse that. And it says here, oh, I love the word of God. See, we always read it, but we never really read it. We just read through it. But see, when I come across something like that, I call that a search engine. I call that a key word. I call that a key statement. I call that something important about what he's saying. First thing I kind of read and I said, ooh, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated. I want to know more about heaven, don't you? I'm tired of earth and the news, the nightly news on, on, on ABC. Tells me about El Paso. I'm tired of that. I want to know about the news in heaven. I want to know about the spiritual things in God. So I can what? Share them with others. And so I pay attention to something like this. That God, that this man that Jesus is telling the story about, which I love how Jesus just makes up stories because he's God. He can do whatever he wants. He has all the ability, all the authority, and all the power to do his will. He's the greatest storyteller that anybody could ever be. And, and when he tells a story, they're full with so much wisdom and knowledge that you just grasp for air because you're like, man, that was deep, Jesus. Once you finally get it. So pay attention. He says that he is dividing it up proportion to their abilities. That means this master knew about all three different people before he set out to make them trustees and stewards. That means God knows about all of you guys in here before he decided on which gift he was going to give you. Are you getting the illustration? We're going to start slow. So I can just move on into it. And so this, and so the servant who received five bags of silver began to invest the money and earn five more. And then it says, the servant with two bags of silver also went to work and earned two more. Title of my sermon, Can God Trust You With a Few Things? And then it went on said, but the servant who received one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. And my former power voice, go on, Lee, why do you think he did that? Well, we're going to find out. Remember, this is Jesus telling this wonderful story. I love Jesus. Love Jesus. I just love how you just, you just cool, man. Okay? And then after a long time, their masters return. After a long time. Listen. When God set you up on the earth and you came out of your mama's womb before the foundations of the earth was created and he gave you your freckles, he gave you your athleticism, he gave you your muscle tone, he decided what race you would be, he gave you the language that you speak, he said what country and city that you would be born. He did all these specifics for you, right? He knew your ability, but the thing is, he put you on earth for how long of a time? And he said, I'm going to give you this, this, and this, and I'm going to put you on earth for 60, 70, 80 years, and then I'm going to come back, and I'm going to ask you what you did with those gifts I gave you. Do you see the illustration now? Don't look at it as talents and coin and money. Look at it that everything in this world is a gift from God. You are a gift from God. Imagine if people valued their life and wouldn't have suicide. They would look at their life and it was a gift. Even if they're eating pig slop right now at this very moment, like the prodigal son. But if we read the rest of the story about the prodigal son, he came back and he was blessed because he realized he was a gift from God. And his life meant more than what he was doing. Amen? Amen. And so we go on and we can, and after a long time, the master returned from the trip. After a long time, Jesus is going to ask us, and he's going to call them forward to give an account on how they had used his money. And the servant who had entrusted with the five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest, and I have earned five more. What does God say? The master was full of praise. He said, uh, well done, my good and faithful servant. That's the first thing God's going to do to you. And then he says, you've been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you more responsibility. That sounds like a promotion. And then he says, and let's celebrate. Oh, that sounds like an honor. 
Pay attention to those three things because I'm going to end with those three things. This is, this is clever. Okay? And the servant who had received two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest, and I have earned two more. Hmm. And the master said, well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in handing in a small amount, so I will give you many more responsibility. Let's celebrate together. Hmm. And then the servant with one bag of silver came and said this. Here comes the excuses. And so uh, the servant said with one bag of silver came and said, Master, I knew you was a harsh man. Really? Harsh mean uh, he was a hard businessman. He was stiff and fair. He held you accountable. Let me say it on this side. He held you accountable. Oh, no, no. Our culture says we don't own it. We don't take care. We don't need no accountability, right? Okay. So pay attention. Here we go. And he says this. He goes, uh, he says, I knew you was a harsh man harvesting crops you didn't plant. Insult. And uh, uh, harvesting crops you, you didn't gather. Another insult. And uh, gathering crops you didn't cultivate. And he says, and I was afraid to lose your money. So I hid it in the earth. And look, here it is. Let's transfer. Let's transfer this to us. So God give you all these abilities and all these gifts. And he put a, a spirit within you to run and not go weary, to help, to do ministry, to do these things. And what did you do? You squandered your gift. You said, I'm not going to share with nobody. You wasn't a good steward. It's not always just about money. It could be about your spirit. It could be about your time and your talents. It could be about the gift that God has given you. Are you using your gift today? And so this is what he said. And so, uh, but the master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. I, I kind of like to hear, well done, good job. <laughs> Let me promote you and let's celebrate. You know when Jesus starts off his conversation for your excuses in life, and he says, you wicked and lazy servant. But my mama didn't raise me right. God, I grew up in the ghetto. God, I started smoking pot at 13. Uh, God, uh, uh, my daddy was mean. God, uh, uh, I didn't have a good job. Uh, God, uh, uh, you lazy and wicked and excuseful servant. Jesus didn't have anything either. Neither did Paul, neither did Peter, neither did John, neither did Philip, neither did any of the other ones. They didn't have air conditioning. They didn't have no Air Jordans. They didn't have no Isaiah jeans. Their feet was crusty. Their breath was stinky. They was brown and dark skinned because they had no air conditioning. They slept outside. Crickets, spiders, scorpions, snakes was all sleeping with them. So don't tell me about your situation. Your past doesn't define your future. It is to remind you where you come from. It does not hold us hostage. It moves us into the glory and the presence of what God has established for us. The earth said, oh, we ain't got nothing. God says you got everything you need because I'm Jehovah Jireh. I'm your provider. And then he ordered, take the money from this servant. God's going to strip you of your gifts. He's going to say, give me back that athleticism. He's going to say, give me back that smart brain you got. He's going to say, give me back that creative thinking. He's going to say, give me back that talent I gave you. Give me back that ministry of, of, of helps that I gave you. Give me back that ability to teach and preach. Give me my gifts back. I stand here before you thinking, if I didn't come back to God, I would have been stripped of my gifts. I'm not going to be able to finish this. Hmm. It didn't work out that way, did it? I had a down time. I just knew I had a plan. 
Then he ordered, take the money from the servant and give it to the one with the ten bags of silver. To those who use well what they are given. To those who use well what they are given. Listen to this. He said, even more will be given. And they will have an abundance. Huh. Isn't that good how God works it out for you? If he can trust you with a few things, he's going to give you more things. He says, but from those who do nothing, even what little they You know why you were born for? So you can learn the lesson of what not to be. God gives you great love. He says, now throw this useless servant. You think that my life is useless? It is if it's all about you, yourself, and I. He said, throw this useless servant into outer darkness where there will be a weeping and a gashing of teeth. Stand up. Listen. At the end of your life on earth, you will be evaluated and rewarded according to how you have handled what God has entrusted to you. I didn't even get to get to the end of the sermon because there's so much more to it and I just felt this is a good stopping point and we have the momentum built on it. So next time I preach this, we'll finish it up and we'll get into the next series. So here's a synopsis of everything. Can God trust you with a few things? I love how Jesus' parable is not even about money. He started this parable saying, this is to illustrate what the kingdom of heaven it is. And I've established that there's earthly wisdom and then there's heavenly wisdom. And we're going to find out that as we've closed this Syria, that the way we manage our worldly affairs is directly related to our spiritual life. That one will hurt. That one will convict. That one will bring forth self-evaluation. That one will cut and divide, just like the Word of God is. It's quick and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing and dividing asunder the heart from the spirit. And you're going to find out that there's a whole another expectation that God has for us. And it's not to make you feel bad, but it's to make you get right. It's not to make you say, I'm going to do better, and you just do it because it's in the moment. It's for you to become your lifestyle. It's for it to become who you are in God. And listen, it is your chosen identity of who you are in the spirit, not who you are in the flesh. It's not a hard walk. It's a constant reminder that you have to so ever be conscious of who you are in God first. Not who you are in the world. There is nothing on this earth that you're going to take with you. Not your job, not your position, not your skills, not your wealth, not your fame, not your fortune. It's just going to be you. What did you do with the gifts that I've given you? I gave a sermon where I talked about the, the good Samaritan that helped the man that was beaten by robbers. And I gave you an illustration of how the Catholic priest walked right by him. The Levite priest walked right by him. Oh, the Holy Roller Christian walked right by him. But the heathen.
chosen, the one not chosen, the one that knew that God gave him a gift to serve, the one that wasn't called, the one that wasn't popular, the one that people didn't know, but that Samaritan who was considered someone not worthy of salvation, a Gentile. He stopped and he helped the man that had been robbed. It's not about your wealth. It's not about your status. It's not about your position. It's about your heart. Everything that God does to our lives is about the condition of our heart. Can he trust your heart? If I make you a millionaire, can I trust your heart? Are you going to remember what you give us for? So many start off like the rich man. They start off obeying all the laws. Another parable. Oh, thank you, God. You just reminded me about these stories. And the rich man was a devoted Jew. He, he kept the Ten Commandments. He kept the Sabbath. He made it holy. He did his sacrifices every year on the Day of Atonement. He followed all the laws. And he comes to Jesus and he said, God, what must I do to earn eternal heaven? And Jesus says, sell everything you have, give to the poor, and then follow me. It was a direct relationship that I'm going to do next week with his worldly position, worldly wealth versus his spiritual richness. And that man chose to hold on to his world and not grab his spiritual world. And he put his head down and he said, I can't hold and he missed an opportunity to have eternity with Jesus. Right there in the flesh, in real time, the Son of God, the creator of heaven and earth, said, listen, I don't care about your fame and fortune, but I want you to spend eternity with me. I want you to take hold of this spiritual wealth that I have for you, these spiritual gifts that I have for you. And all you have to do is one thing. Can God trust you with a few things? Amen. So those that have moments of reflection, you go home because life is a reflection and you reflect on the things. Every man and woman, when you lay yourself down to sleep, don't say you don't do it because I do it. I reflect on my day. I reflect where I missed it with my kids. I reflect on how I answered my daughter or my son. I reflect on how I blew it at work. I reflect on the word that I'm teaching or the word that I heard. I reflect on everything that happens. We do it. It is part of what we are and who God made us to be. So when you go home, you reflect on this word. And if you never come back to hear it, the next part, catch it on YouTube. Get this part in you because this is, this is fundamental. This is going to change the way you think. God says if we want to change, Romans 12 and 2, we have to change the way we think. That's when Christ renews our thinking. We can't be like the old way now. Once you've gotten this word, you can't say, God, I never heard it before. You can't say, I didn't know. Because God has marked and, tamped and stamped this day with the seal of approval that my servant Mike brought the word forward for you to understand. Can God trust you? A few things. Amen? Let's pray. Father, you said your yoke is easy and your burden is light. Father, sometimes it don't seem that way. Sometimes it seems that your yoke is choking me and your burden is so, so heavy. But Father, every time I try to reflect on an excuse, I think of another scripture that comes and God, you say, come to me all ye that are burdened and heavy laden. Father, I want to be trusted. I want to be trustworthy. I want you to hold me accountable with the gifts that you've given me. 
Father, I thank you for my life. For I have never in my life been so consumed to give away my gifts every day, every week, every month. I'm so glad I get it, God. I understand it's not about the wealth that you've given me, but it's about my ability to give it away. To give it away and not hesitate, not to think about tomorrow, but to give it away in you, Father, because you've instructed me to. Doesn't matter whether it's resources, whether it's time, whether it's opportunity, whether it's just me praying for a brother and sister. So Father, I ask that in Jesus' name that you would continue, continue to work on our unfinished selves. Continue molding and grinding us and shaping us and breaking us and making us into your son's image. Let us endeavor to get it right, Father. Let us run unto you. Forsaking all others. As the song said, I've left all the world to follow Jesus. No more looking back. No more going back. Just pressing towards the prize that awaits for us. Oh God, let us be as the servants with the five and the two bags of silver. Let us be found favorable in your eyes. <coughs> Father, we love to hear the words, well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. That's my desire. That's my prayer for this church. That we will be found favorable in your eyes. That we will walk through each door of truth that we come across. That we will forsake the things that were lies and deceptions in our life. The things that were stained our image and scarred our, our spirit. That we would press through those things and, and, and lay hold to the things of you, Father. <clears throat> Father, that you can trust us with the heavenly riches. That you can anoint us spiritually to do the work of the kingdom of God. Don't lose hope, oh God. We're trying. One step at a time. We're working on it. One step at a time. Oh Lord, have mercy. Let us forever grow in you, Father. And continue to draw closer to you. As God, you said, if you draw close to me, I will draw close to you. So many distractions, God. So many snares in this world. So many things to entangle us. So many lies that deceive us. So many things that we believe in and trust in that is not of you. Lord, don't lose hope on us. Continue to purchase. Have mercy on us.